Welcome to another episode of Investing with IBD. It's Wednesday, November 29th, 2023, and I'm Justin Nielsen alongside our co-host who joins us every week. It's Arusha Paris from O'Neill Global Management. Uh, how are you doing, Arusha? I'm doing well, Justin. Well, we've got an exciting show for you today because uh, when we say 80s bands, what, what, what's your favorite 80s bands, uh, Arusha? You know, I, I do you remember the eighties? No. <laughs> I, I didn't really like too many eighties bands, but oh. there was there was there was a point where I did get into poison. Okay, very good. Well, I mean, I I went to a Guns N' Roses Metallica concert yeah, back yeah, in nineteen ninety two. Yeah, uh, I just just saw Tears for Fears in concert not too long ago. They're they're getting up there in years, but when we say eighties bands in the finance area, we're really talking about Bollinger bands. So it's my pleasure to bring to the stage here uh, John Bollinger, the creator of Bollinger bands. He's also the um, you know president of Bollinger Capital Management. Great to have you on the show here, John. Oh, my pleasure, Justin. Thanks for having me on. So we're also going to get into, of course, Bollinger Bands and you know how you kind of came up with this concept and more importantly, the way to use this concept uh, for everyday trading. We'll also talk a little bit about ETFs uh, and the pitfalls and you know reasons why you might want to be shifting more towards individual stocks. So we got a lot to cover, but let's get right into it. And John, you were kind enough to uh, provide us with a little presentation yourself to kind of help address the issue of Bollinger Bands. So we can kind of go to your presentation so we can kind of walk through the the concept here. But first, before we kind of tell people what it is, what what was it that made you kind of think that this was a good idea and something that uh, technical analysis needed? Well, um, before I get to the answer to that, I have a, a little tiny story to tell you. OK. Um, Back in the days, um, I'm, a, I'm an old fan of the William O'Neill Company. Um, and um, back in the days, I used to, on Saturday mornings, mm -hmm. we would actually go down to the printing plant to get the daily graphs wow. charts as they came off the press Saturday morning. And a whole uh -huh. bunch of whole bunch of market junkies and you know market timers, stock pickers and stuff gather around, you know, all holding our little paper cups of coffee. And, and <laughs> Oh, do you have any pictures of that? That would just be awesome to it see a be picture uh, from, that. you know, I'm probably I'm, see who you could pick out in the crowd. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I don't. And then, yeah. Then well, and then you also me. were on the, the, the financial network. Uh, th there was a show that Bill had on. And so you you got to chat with him a little bit during the uh, those mm -hmm. FNN days, um, you know, uh, b before and after that show. Right. Yeah, yeah, that was a very special opportunity. Um, my office was um, just outside of the green room, um, which is where guests would uh, um, okay would gather before they were due to be on air. And and you know, Bill would come in, and I'd go into the green room, sit and chat with him. It was a real opportunity. I got to do the same with many other people. Um, uh -huh. So that was uh, that was a really fantastic benefit of being at FNN in those years. Yeah. Well, and John, you know, honestly, even before just getting into why you came up with the Bollinger Bands and kind of what the issues saw with technical analysis, how did you get into even technical analysis? How did you get even into the industry? <laughs> it, it, Here's it, another it, story, it sounds like. I, I, it, we it, like it's stories. It's a long here. story, but I'll try to make really short of it. My mother was getting ready to retire. Um, she, had a, she had a small business in, in, in New York. And um, she was getting really bad financial advice. And mm. she knew that I'd like stocks and I'd, I'd, I'd had an interest in them for years and years. And she said, well, how about you take care of my retirement? Mm. So um, no pressure. That, was, that, that was the door. Um, <laughs> so I tried just straight up fundamental analysis and I found that very frustrating. And I tried, you know, brokerage house research and I found that very frustrating. Um, and then I tried technical analysis. And the moment I started doing technical analysis, I understood that that was that that, that was it for me. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's how I got in. That would be 1978, 79, wow. 1980 mm -hmm. in that range. Mm -hmm. And of course, you do have uh, both uh, your CFA and CMT. Uh, Arusha has a CMT as well. I am CMT less, um, but you know, <laughs> oh, who's, who's so counting? Sad. <laughs> I know exactly. <laughs> um, so okay, let's go ahead and get into now the, the the Bollinger Band story. How'd you come up with the Bollinger Bands? 
So I was an option trader in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. um, option premiums were running very high. It was it was pretty easy to uh, um, make a living trading options uh, in those days. And But the key to option trading is the same as it's always been, and that's a, a good estimate of volatility. Mm -hmm. I, I was lucky I had an early microcomputer. This was in the days before PCs, but I had a spreadsheet called SuperCalc. And I, I would use it to, to calculate... Um, the, the volatilities for, for for option trading, and, and one day I copied the formula for volatility down a, a, a column of data, and I saw that it was changing over time. Mm -hmm. it, it, that's that was it. That doesn't sound special today because we know that volatility is volatile. But back <laughs> in those days, we thought that volatility was a, a, like a, a property, like the house mm -hmm. is white or the car is blue, wow. um, mm -hmm. and that it didn't change o over over time. Mm -hmm. So I had been using fixed width trading bands. We called them percentage trading bands. Sure. And I was looking away. I was looking for a way to automate setting them because it was it was a very labor intensive uh, process to 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 set the width of the bands, um, pencil paper overlays and stuff like that back in those days. Yeah. Um, and the problem really was is that you let your emotions into the trading process when you did that because if you're bullish you set the bands to present a bullish picture if you're bearish you set the bands to present a bearish picture so i wanted to automate them and i i saw that volatility was changing over time and i said "Ooh, i bet i can use that to set the width of bands oh interesting so so when you when so when you started seeing like the bands tighten where you just kind of started and play around with it and you start, started seeing the bands tighten, volatility decreasing, all of a sudden you, you saw a pretty strong move one way or the other? Is that so how actually, it kind of started? Actually, that wasn't the start. Uh, okay. um, for me, that, that was the second stage for me. The first stage for me was just to, uh, um, if, if, if the price of a stock was high enough to get to the upper band, I would then compare the action of a couple of indicators, volume indicators and such like that, and see if they confirmed. And if they didn't, then I would take that as a non-confirmation. And the same on the downside. If you know weakness got down there, if the indicators confirm the weakness, then you just assume that you're going to go further. Yeah. But uh, um, you know, it, it was like that for me in the beginning. It was only later, a um, couple of years later, when I when I really started to focus on the the dynamic changing quality of the bands and and talk about things like the squeeze when the bands are very <laughs> tight together or the bulge when 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 the bands are very 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 far apart mm -hmm. well it, it might be a good idea for us to bring some visuals up at this point and so for people listening in uh, as we get to this visual component you might just uh, look back on this uh, at your leisure and go to investors.com podcast or uh, on, onto the YouTube channel where you can see the visuals. Um, but let's go ahead and start. Um, uh, again, you kind of said that the, the Bollinger Bands are helping you define kind of a high and low on a relative basis. Um, so wh what do you mean by that on a relative basis? So um, by definition, prices are high um, when they are at the upper Bollinger Band. And by definition, prices are relatively low when they are at the lower Bollinger Band. Um, mm -hmm. that's sort of the key to all trading bands, not just Bollinger Bands. There, sure. there are many other flavors of trading bands out there that are, are, are used by traders. But that's sort of the, the generic idea behind all trading bands. You then use that information to compare price action to the action of indicators or, or to do pattern recognition, um, things like that. So they, they give you a frame of reference. That that's that on a relative basis. They give you a relative frame of reference to frame price action and make decisions, rigorous decisions. I might yeah. add. And and just real quickly, you know, again, this is something that a lot of us might take for granted because it it really does seem kind of simple when you when you think about it. You know, just you know, you, you pick a time period and do standard deviations. But what what time period? Why did you decide on a time period of twenty? So, you know, that that was the time period we were using at the time. At, mm -hmm. at the time, the most popular market timing system was a very simple system using the Dow Jones Industrial Average and and a 21 day moving average and bands that were spread four and a half percent above it and four and a half percent below it. Um, that was just the. the I don't know who came up with that, but it had been around for some years and it was a very accurate market timing system. We would compare price within those bands to the to the action of two indicators, one 
based on up and down volume and the other based on advances and declines. Mm -hmm. And if you get to the upper band and one of those indicators was negative, that would be a, a, a sell alert. If you get to the lower band, one of those indicators was positive, that would be a buy alert. So I just adopted the the, the 21. I, I don't know. I changed it. <laughs> I changed to 20 at some point. I couldn't really tell you why, but yeah. there it is. Yeah, just, just just to make it even. And then you're just taking a standard deviation, right? Or two standard deviations, I should say. Um, yeah. And you below, know. just that easy, yeah, right? Yeah, the volatility calculation is simply the population standard deviation calculation. And the upper band is two times the standard deviation above the middle band, which is the 20-day moving average. And the lower band is two times the standard deviation below the same middle band that 20 period moving average and of course for those uh, stats geeks that kind of tells you that most of the action is going to be in between those bands um, but as you said it's really about where you're at within the band so here's here's the dia which is the dow jones industrial average um and what 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 is it that you're looking at here and and how do you use these bands and just so people know and orient themselves the the blue line here is is your 20 day moving average line the upper Correct. red band is your two standard deviations above and your green line is your two standard deviations below correct and then in the clip immediately below price um that sort of jagged line there that's percent b we'll get to that in a couple of minutes and in the clip mm -hmm. beneath that um, that's bandwidth, which tells you how wide the bands are. Mm -hmm. So percent B tells us where we are in relation to the bands. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, you know, I, I've highlighted three setups here. The, the one on the left there is a squeeze. <clears throat> Excuse me. The one on the left there is a squeeze. That's where bandwidth is, is, is very tight and it's a forecast for increased volatility. And you can see that a, a fairly meaningful decline comes out of that squeeze. And over on the right-hand side of the screen, there's another circle and that's a, another squeeze. Um, if you look down to the, to the bottom there, there's a little orange arrow pointing to the trough mm -hmm. in bandwidth. And that's how we identify what, um, when there's a squeeze or, or a bulge. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and, and look, John, John, when when the when you're starting to get that squeeze, when that volatility is really starting to contract, is there kind of a probability that the the trend's going to continue? Like for that second one, did it give you a little bit of indication that maybe it's going to break one way or the other, or you just wait for the break and then you then you then you you go with that trend? Um, I mostly wait for the break. Sometimes um, you can you can tell from the trading dynamics going in into it that there's weakness building up. Um, very often we'll use volume indicators like intraday intensity. That's one of the components of um, the O'Neill um, accumulation distribution um, mm -hmm. uh, ranking. Um, so sometimes we use an indicator like that. Um, and if it's tailing off, if it's showing weakness, then, then we'll look for a decline. Um, in this case, um, you got a little bounce to the upper band and then a downturn. That We call that a head fake. And yeah. that's um, that's actually my favorite um, trade in relation to the squeeze. Mm -hmm. And so what is it that you're using as kind of your your signal? Uh, again, just to be clear, is it is it that break um, yes. below the band once no, you have the one? It, it, it's a, a, a big reversal of price to the mm -hmm. downside. And if, if you, I know it's a little hard to see on this screen, but you can, you know, you, you'll be able to go home and, and look at this on, on the big screens uh, that you all have. Um, you, you can see that there's a nice price reversal in there to the downside. And that would be my signal. Okay. Very good. Uh, the next chart. Oh, wait, wait, one, wait, more, wait. one more area, one more area here to go over. So that, that's a classic W bottom. Um, uh -huh. it's, it's a new low in price that's not a new low in relation to the Bollinger Bands. And okay. for that, the signal is the reversal to the upside. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see that, you know, the you can see the orange line there. Um, I, I'm great. I'm pointing towards the screen. I'm, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm ho hopefully pointing for you. <laughs> you let me know if I'm in the right spot with my red arrow. <laughs> so, um, you, you can see that we make a new low in, in terms of price, but it's yep. not a new low in relation to the Bollinger Bands. You can see that from, from percent B, which is at a higher value on the second low. So we just wait for a reversal to the upside, and that's our signal. Um, and you can see that that leads to a very substantial rally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go ahead and um, 
we already talked about how the defaults for the Bollinger Bands um, are. The yeah, but the bottom line here is, is is really important. People use all different values. You know, some people use really short bands, 10 periods, mm -hmm. and just plus or minus one standard deviation. Some people use really long, exaggerated. Just feel free to adapt all of this to your trading style and to what you do. There's nothing magic about these numbers. These are the numbers that suit me and my trading style and my personality. Um, and that I've used for years, but... There are tons of people using different values and, and, and getting value from, from this framework. Yeah, perfect. Um, so some of the indicators, uh, you've, you've mentioned this percent B. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, when you say it's where you're at in relation to the Bollinger Bands, um, so it's, it's kind of like a stochastic? It's, 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 it, that's exactly correct. That's the formula for stochastics with the Bollinger Bands upper and lower substituted for the periodic high and the periodic low. Uh -huh. So that, that's exactly correct. Okay. Um, um, and I did that on purpose because I wanted bandwidth to read like a technical indicator that, mm -hmm. that technicians would, would, would find intuitively easy to, uh, um, to use. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's just the distance from the last price to the lower band divided by the upper distance from the upper band to the lower band. So it'll be one when you're at the upper band, zero when you're at the lower band, and 0.5 when you're at the middle band. The midpoint, exactly. Um, okay, here's another uh, chart on SPY. Uh, so uh, what, are, what are we looking at here? So in the, the smaller circle shows you a little tiny W pattern. We make a new low in price that's not a new low in relation to the Bollinger Bands. You look at that little tiny line, orange line, on percent B, and you see the divergence there. And then we come back up and we make a new low in price inside the bigger circle. And you can see the longer term divergence. And this is something that happens time and time and time again. We call it the fractal quality of these right. patterns. We'll make a, 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 a little a W bottom and then it'll become part of a larger uh, W bottom. It just, the pattern repeats so many times. Very, very interesting. I, I, I'm, it, it, it's just the sort of thing that adds value in, in increases your confidence in, in the patterns that you're seeing. Often you'll see a little W on the left-hand side of a big W and a mm -hmm. little M on the top, the All apex right, right. W, and then another yeah. little W on the right-hand side. Mm -hmm. makes, this makes it much easier. Mm -hmm. And so, again, you know, what you're really looking at here is that divergence where the new low is, is happening, but you're not getting that confirmation of a new low on the percent B. And so you just look for that reversal again, right? Exactly. Okay, great. And we wait for the reversal because when we just have the new low, right, the, 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 we wait for confirmation. We wait mm -hmm. for, for, for the market to confirm our opinion because mm -hmm. it's only opinion until you get the confirmation. And right. where, and on this chart here, where would you consider the confirmation to happen? Is it it's taking the up? First, it's the first green bar okay. inside the lower band. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. Wow, that's pretty early still, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah quite quite the move from there. Um, so the nice, then, thing about these, nice thing about these trades is that you're risking a very small amount. Yeah. If you go to a new low, the trade's broken, mm -hmm. right? So. Yep. And and the potential is you know for a trip to the upper band, so yeah. you 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 you're risking a small amount in in chasing uh, a much larger potential, and so the risk reward of these setups um, is is quite attractive. Mm -hmm. like that a lot. Now you, you got a nice move here, uh, you know what we're showing here on spy all the way from four ten up to four fifty four. Um, it did touch the upper band here right around four fifty. Uh, did it would that have been a sell signal at all or you just kind of no. let it ride you, or until you kind of get that same non-confirmation exactly there's nothing about a tag of the upper band that's a sell signal in and of itself you need something else you know some some other form of technical deterioration because prices can and will walk up the upper band and they can and will walk down the lower band and mm -hmm. that's not a long series of buys or a long series of sells that's simply a walk down the a walk down the band or a walk up the band. What we look for is, you know, conditions to deteriorate in a pattern to form that tells us that, you know, it's uh, reversal is ripe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can almost see it on the left hand side of the oh if you go back for a second. Yeah. On the left hand side of the chart, how it's just walking along the upside of the band and just bouncing off the just the, the moving average, which is, you know, just keeps staying in the upper part. 
Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's a typical. That's the typical signature of of a strong advance. Mm -hmm. um, now we've got a, a chart here with Boeing, and uh, so now we're, we've we've gone from an index because you can use this on indexes, individual stocks. So is there anything that you have to change uh, when you're looking at an individual stock, or all of that math is kind of done for you, right? No, this is where I started. I started trading individual stock options using these tools and 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 such like that using 20 periods and plus or minus two standard deviations mm -hmm. um, here you see on the left hand side you see a classic little m type top that leads to a, a, a really meaningful decline and then you know that's followed by a w type bottom uh, again defined by the bulge brands and um which leads to a substantial um a substantial rally so you just look you look for these setups and um you know that's the nice thing about trading in individual stocks with the market's the market right you got one market basically yeah. for mm -hmm. americans and, and I, I suppose that there's variations like you know the dow or the qqq something like that but the market's the market for stocks you know it's it's a different thing you just go through until you find you know, the stock that has the right pattern, the right setup for you, that has the right risk reward characteristics for you and and, and trade that. And if, if you know that you can't, you know, try to force trades on every stock, you just go through and, you know, rifle through the list and uh, eventually you find a setup that you like and you go with it. Are mm -hmm. you generally using daily t time frames, weekly time frames? What, what's your kind of preference or all, 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 all of the above? I'm a daily and weekly trader. Okay. I, I use daily Bollinger Bands and weekly Bollinger Bands. And, and what is your normal time frame in terms of your holding period that you're looking at? Or just as long as the trade is working? Or do you have kind of a, a typical for you? It could be as long as the trade is working. Um, you'll see when we talk about stocks later on, um, um, an example of a holding that I've held for years and years and years. Um, it's just the right stock in the right in in, in, in the right you know, environment and doing really well. So I don't find any reason to sell it. Um, um, so th I guess there's a difference between trading and investing. Sometimes you get into something in a trade and you realize that it's going to work out to be a longer term investment. So maybe you, instead of selling it, you trim it back a little bit and hold on to the, mm -hmm. to the remaining position and try, you know, for a home run instead of, uh, um, instead of a single. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, let, let's just uh, talk real quickly a little bit more about the bandwidth. You know, again, this is kind of how wide the Bollinger Bands are, what you're looking at here. And so. Yes. So this is just the distance from the upper band to the lower band. We call it bandwidth and we divide it by the middle band so that it's a normalized quantity of mm -hmm. percent. Um, mm -hmm. Again, very simple calculations. We use these to um, find squeezes and bulges. So we say that a squeeze is where trends are born and a bulge is where trends go to die. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and and you, you see that here. Um, we got a couple of squeezes that lead to, to, you know, that lead to big moves. And um, on the right hand side of the screen, you see a bulge that marks the end of that downtrend. Mm hmm. Yeah. Now, what about uh, around earnings? I'm sure that a lot of times uh, the, the extra volatility with earnings, you get a gap up or a gap down. That's going to potentially really increase that that Bollinger bandwidth. Uh, yeah. Do you yeah, do, it's, handle it's, those differently at all? You know, the market's reaction to earnings is becoming has become ever more problematic over the years, um, you know. Um, especially the market's reaction to guidance, which seems ridiculous to me because at best, <laughs> it, at best it's a forecast and often they're dead wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so but the market really is taking guidance to heart and, and putting a lot of volatility um, into the market. It just makes our job harder. That's all it, it's all, mm -hmm. all it is. You, know? yeah. you have to, uh, you know, one of Charlie Munger's favorite uh, sayings uh, um, was that if you can't stand a real decline, then you shouldn't be investing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, I'm not sure that I agree with that in, in its totality, but I would say that a variation of that is if you can't stand this sort of volatility that we're seeing in the markets now, um, and you, you know, uh, uh, one of these guidance uh, reactions is going to cause you to to get out of a stock, then you really ought not to have been in it to, in it to start with. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's see, here's another one with uh, cat uh, caterpillar on the on the 
Bollinger band width. So what are we looking at here? So just look at the dead center of the screen. You see a squeeze and a break mm -hmm. to the upside leading to a nice rally. And then you see a bulge marking the end of that rally. And the reason I put this chart on here is when you see the boat bandwidth turn down like that, it, we call that a bulge. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get an immediate price reversal. It means mm -hmm. that that leg of the move is over and you could easily get a consolidation or a reversal. You need to look at price and study what's, hap what's happening. Often, um, it will be a consolidation and you go sideways for a week or two to just the move. People, you know, invest stocks, as they say, gotten a little bit of head of, head of itself. So it needs a pause to refresh, something like that. Um, but sometimes... Um, it'll be a reversal. And if you look at the right-hand side of the chart, um, you can see a squeeze that led to a decline and the bulge, instead of leading to a consolidation, leads to a reversal. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you head strongly in the other direction. So I wanted to show you both pictures of, of, of you know, both sorts of reactions to uh, bulges here. Great. Well, this is, uh, I, I think, a great tutorial for, you know, people starting out with Bollinger Bands. Um, where... Uh, of course, you know, BollingerBands.com is a place where they can get a lot more information. You also have YouTube channels. Um, I mean, there's so much written about Bollinger Bands, not just from you, but from a lot of technical analysis. What's what's kind of your favorite place to send people? You know, we have a bunch of tutorial um, in, information, um, free to, to, tutorial information at BollingerBands.com. You mentioned uh, there's a big YouTube presence as well um those are two grand resources for uh, people who want to learn about the this sort of investing and this sort of trading awesome well we're going to take a break and when we come back we're going to have john bollinger apply these rules to the current market talk a little bit about etfs and also talk about some stocks that are on his radar stay tuned we'll be right back Market Smith will give you a huge edge in the stock market. Better stocks, bigger profits. Market Smith is the top research platform for IBD. It's just the best tool for individual stock selection. Everything within Market Smith is designed to bring those best stocks to the surface. It does a lot of the work for you of filtering down to the potential leaders. It's when you take the training wheels off and you're ready to invest on a more professional level. Market Smith will help you take control of your investment life. If you want to get serious about investing, start your membership today. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, along with my weekly co-host, Arusha Pires, who joins me every week from O'Neill Global Advisors. And then we also have on the show this week, John Bollinger of Bollinger Capital Management. Of course, he is also the creator of Bollinger Bands. So we've been talking a little bit about how to use these technical indicators to kind of get a sense of uh, buy signals, sell signals, and what's happening with the stock. So let's talk a little bit about the market. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to stick with Thinkorswim uh, just to kind of uh, be a little bit more uh, in tune with the Bollinger Bands and and kind of see how to use these. Um, right now, I'm looking at the S&P 500 SPY. Uh, do you have a preference in terms of what you look at uh, with with your, your market timing? Um, I like the tradable. So um, rather than look, looking at the index SPX, I, I look at SPY or rather than look at the Dow, I look at DIA. Mm -hmm. um, rather than look at the NASDAQ, I, I look at QQQ. Um, I just feel that, um, that you know, what we're going to end up doing is is with the tradable. So that's what we should analyze. Right. Yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So uh, right now we've got SPY up. Um, what... Uh, I mean, certainly something that sticks out to me right here is the fact that you've got this, um, you know, this touch of the, the lower Bollinger Band right there on October, you know, 27th, which was right around the, the, the bottom of the market. Um, was there anything that kind of told you that this rally was uh, potentially going to happen the way it unfolded? So where your cursor is, is one of my favorite little Bollinger Band um patterns it's a what we call a two bar reversal at the lower band um it's where you you have one bar a big big red bar um ho hopefully penetrating the, the lower band um that's when it's easiest um mm -hmm. to see and, and and understand and then immediately the next bar reverses that action and is back inside the band so that was we call those two bar reversals we trade them all the time um they're, they're um 
they're just um you know they're, they're just terrific little setups once again we talked about this a little earlier um they're very low risk reward um uh setups you know you're mm -hmm. risking just a little bit if you go to a new low um you know you you're only uh um you know your risk is very well defined and the potential is a trip up up to the upper band and if it's really strong then a walk up to the upper band as you see here mm -hmm. so we we did hit that upper band um anything that looks worrisome to you at this point yeah you you had your you had your uh cursor on it just a second ago that peak in bandwidth on the, the in, in the lower thing where bandwidth turns down um yeah right there Mm -hmm. So that's what we call a bulge. Um, that's a very high value of bandwidth um, and um, tells you that there's been a lot of volatility in the market. In this case, it was positive volatility. Price is rising. Um, and when it turns down um, is often an indication that either you're going to see a trend reversal. I don't think that's the case here. Or you're going to see consolidation. And that is, in fact, what we are seeing. We've gone sideways for five or six sessions um, here now, digesting the gains um, off of the low that we just talked about prior. Mm -hmm. and, and then what are you looking for for, like, say, say it's a potential resumption of the trend? Is it just more on price taking out those highs? Or is there anything that's going to happen with the, the bandwidth uh, that does it start turning up or something? Or well, so the, the ideal setup is to march sideways until you get to the middle bend and then okay. prices take off from there. Um, you know, but like all ideal things, you don't see it all that often. Right. Um, <laughs> but when you see it, you really do know what to do, right? I, yeah. I, <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's the market. It, it never, um, it, it often rhymes. It doesn't yes. repeat. Um, so it never traces out exactly the pattern that, that you'd hope for. Hopefully you're paying enough attention um, so that um, when the market does turn, um, either up or down out of a consolidation pattern, you recognize that turn and act appropriately. Mm -hmm. And let's just uh, real quickly go over to QQQ. Uh, certainly the, the tech has been uh, dominant uh, for most of this year. Um, and uh, a lot of talk about the Magnificent Seven and everything like that. Um, kind of traced out in a similar way where you got this, uh, you know, this reversal. Now, it, it seemed like at first, you, you, you did go below that lower band. This was an inside day that followed. Is that still okay uh, to be inside the inside the band again, but it's an inside day? Any conflict it, there? It, it's okay. It's not a great one like it was on the, uh, on, on the SPY where it was much, much clearer. Um, mm -hmm. I would go count, count um, three bars to the left where you have that large green bar. I'm sorry, three bars to the right. To the yeah, right. yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. That would be my entry for for, mm -hmm. for this pattern. Um, when you've definitely cleared that high from the reversal. Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh-huh, perfect. Yeah. Um, that would and then, then we have the same exact situation right. here with, uh, with a bulge rolling over and a consolidation. I would point out that, you know, the QQQs have really been running SPY for the, for the past year or, or, or more. Mm -hmm. Um, it, the, the, we started out with Fang, and then we got Fan Mag, and now we've got the Magnificent <laughs> Seven. <laughs> you, know, you know how that went. Uh, but um, they're they're not only big; um, those stocks are not only big in QQQ. They're also huge in SPY. Yes, which so. is cap weighted as well. So uh -huh. they've been moving SPY around like no tomorrow. Yeah. So I, mean, I don't know how much differentiation there really is right now between. Uh, uh, SPY and QQQ. Yeah, yeah, you definitely do get some some watering down in in SPY, and sometimes you can get it to uh, outperform when like oils and thing and industrials that aren't represented at all in QQQ yeah. or financials yeah. that aren't represented at all in QQQ. But yeah, I think I think you're right for the most part. Uh, it's it's sometimes hard to tell them apart because the bulk of the weight is kind of in the same stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. um, you know, speaking of ETFs, uh, something that you brought up in our in our pre-show was the the fact that you kind of don't like ETFs as much. I mean, I'm sure they have their place for market timing, but, um, you know, what what is it about individual stocks that you prefer over ETFs? I Well, I think there's better risk reward and better appreciation potential in individual stocks than there is in ETFs. Um, 
but you know what i was hinting at in 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 the in the pre-show when we talked um was the effect that etfs have on the market as a whole mm -hmm. um you know uh, etfs are are by by rule uh, required to follow the index that they constructed from so the mm -hmm. qqq must follow the nasdaq 100 and the spy must follow the s p 500 and they, they actually have to replicate them um that, that that's the um that's that's the rule uh, that, mm -hmm. that that governs them you you can look at right in the prospectus and see yeah. it so what that does is it has a, it has this thing of, of welding all those stocks together. Um, some people, you know, think that um, when it, they sell out an ETF, it doesn't have any impact. Well, it does have an impact. Um, you sell out a uh, hundred shares in an ETF, and and you know a certain number of every stock in that index is then going to be sold into the marketplace by by the people that create and 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 run the ETFs. So those ETFs have direct um, direct impacts, um, and, and especially pernicious uh, um, example is with the levered um, um, downside oh, right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, downside ETFs. You know, people buy them, and that results in direct and immediate selling in you know in, in a multiplier effect, whatever the multiplier of of the of the. Um, <clears throat> of the ETF was. So if it's a three X multiplier, um, you buy one share it results in three proto shares, if you will, yeah. derivatives, you know, the ETF yeah. being sold. So, and then going into a low, you have a lot of people stepping up and buying those, those, those inverse ETFs. Um, and that just creates a, a firestorm of selling in, into the low. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I don't think people are really aware of, of, this kind of knock on uh, activity of their trading of ETFs. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we're going to eventually start seeing a switch from you know, where passive investing was the way to go and, you know, outperforming a lot of the active investing eventually back to a stock pickers market and active investing is the definitely a strategy to use. You know what they say from your lips. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I've been, I've been hoping for that for a while. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that for the for an individual investor, market timing is a pretty pr pretty tough mistress. I mean, it's really really hard to do um, and, and and do well. I think for a, a typical individual investor, they'd be much better off on on p picking uh, stocks for the for the long run um, and focusing on. Um, for example, using Bollinger Bands on them, and when you pull back to the lower band, adding to that position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a typical idea for for a high relative strength stock. Um, you know, I think most people who who are doing this, a lot of people are doing this to be day traders. I, I'm not addressing them. I'm talking about people who who are trying to create their retirements and and, and yeah. trying to invest for the long haul and, and create real wealth um, for themselves. And their families. I think those people are much, much better off um, owning um, these um, these stocks. Um, we call them growth stocks. Uh, they're, they're they're companies that are able to grow year after year after year after year. And you know, you you buy them on pullbacks and and you just hold on to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, w one other thing I want to address because you, you kind of said that when you first started out, you were trying to find your way and um, you, you, you did try fundamentals and technicals just spoke to you more. Uh, when, when analyzing the market, it's really hard, especially uh, the last couple of years with everything that's been going on with the Fed and, uh, you know, we've, we've had wars in Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, you know, all of these things, recession fears, inflation fears. Uh, where does the macro economic picture fit in to your uh, thesis or does it just not? No, I, I actually, years and years ago, back in the 80s, I coined a term called rational analysis. It's the juncture of the sets of fundamental and technical analysis. Um, and I believe that, you know, that that's actually the way to go. I, actually, me and Bill O'Neill talked about this quite quite a bit because he was a real believer um, mm -hmm. um, yeah. in that idea as well. I, I think he had different uh, terminology than I had. Um, but it didn't matter because our, our views were, were more or less the same, that, you know, you use the best 
the best tools from the fundamental toolbox and use the best tools from the technical toolbox and you combine them to to, to make a superior tool set for investing Speaking yeah uh and perfect think, you know i think that's the way to go you know mm -hmm. I, the world's a little poorer for 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 a bill having passed recently but uh, mm -hmm. um um you know i i think his ideas are are, are, are powerful is RS rankings is accumulation uh, distribution rankings uh, I, I think these are these are really really great tools mm -hmm. and then we should also mention you, you mentioned Charlie Munger uh, earlier of course uh, he just he just passed yesterday as we're taping this uh, so yeah we, we've lost a couple giants in the field um, but uh, we we still we still have some left so we're really glad that you're here with us John <laughs> to, to share your knowledge and when we come back <laughs> We're going to go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the stocks that are on John's radar. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll be right back. Market Smith will give you a huge edge in the stock market. Better stocks, bigger profits. Market Smith is the top research platform for IBD. It's just the best tool for individual stock selection. Everything within Market Smith is designed to bring those best stocks to the surface. It does a lot of the work for you of filtering down to the potential leaders. It's when you take the training wheels off and you're ready to invest on a more professional level. Market Smith will help you take control of your investment life. If you want to get serious about investing, start your membership today. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen here, your host, and joining me as he does every week is Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors, uh, helping out and making sure I stay on the straight and narrow path. Uh, also, keeping me within my bands is John Bollinger this week. He's, uh, uh, of course, at Bollinger Capital Management and creator of Bollinger Bands, and he's been helping us kind of learn how to use this technical indicator, not just with markets, but now we're also going to venture over into individual stocks and talk a little bit about some stocks that are on his radar. So uh, let's go ahead and start out with uh, Cintas uh, Corp. Uh, I've, I've got that up here with the Bollinger Bands and uh, your, your percent B and your uh, bandwidth. So uh, t tell me tell me what it is that you like about this one. Um, it's certainly hard to find stocks right now that aren't extended. Uh, yeah. So what is it that you're looking for here? So I, I brought three stocks uh, um, to chat mm -hmm. with today, and they're, di they're different sorts of examples. Cintus is an example of a long-term hold for us that we add to on pullbacks. Wow. Um, it's a stock that um, has been growing for years and years and years, um, both in terms of its stock price, but um, driving that um, is uh, a very, very strong fundamental growth um, from year to year that's going on for more than 20 years now. Um, so these sort of stocks are, you know, long term wealth producers. Um, they you, you you buy them and you hold them um, for the for the long term. Um, and they can, you know, they do, they can just add value to to your portfolio often. You know, something like this can be a trade that turns into an investment. Mm -hmm. um, you can, you know, you you find a nice setup in a, in in one of the great growth stocks where it's it's pulled back, maybe makes a little W bottom, and if it takes off out of there and 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 becomes really strong, maybe instead of just taking a profit and walking away and trying to find another situation, you can do what we do, which is uh, trim the position back a, a a little bit the first time it makes a a, a meaningful high in in the market. And um, then let the rest of it ride for the, for the longer term, as long as the dynamics of the, of the stock um, don't change. And we're, we're looking, you know, very simple stuff. Um, we're lo just looking for year over year revenue growth, year over year um, uh, bottom line numbers of, of, of all sorts sales growth um, so that it's just the, it's the engine that that drives the stock. So there, there's a, a great chart of it now. Um, you can see it's longer term um, view. And what we well, do actually, these, Justin, maybe switch to the monthly chart because I think that yeah. really gives the amazing <laughs> view. And John, just very quickly, is there an exit strategy to this, or are you just gonna? I mean, is is there? I, I, the is only there, exit strategy would be is if the you know. The business itself, the underlying okay. business okay. itself changes yep. for some reason. If some, you know, if private equity comes after it and, and forces uh, um, 
forces uh, management changes. But with a stock that's performing like this, yeah. you know, it's pretty easy for a board of directors to tell private equity to go uh, right. sit. <laughs> right. Go and have some licorice, right? Some black yeah, licorice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so the, the idea with Bollinger Bands on this, so we'll run weekly Bollinger Bands uh, on a stock like this. And when it pulls back to the lower band, if nothing else has changed, we'll, we'll you know, use that as uh, a couple of things just to add to existing positions, but also to get new clients that have come in um, to the process over over the years um, and give them an opportunity to participate in the, in the longer term kind of capital gains that a stock like this. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, Bill did that study years and years and years ago where he studied, you know, the, the, the best performing stocks of all, all time and tried to find out what common characters, characteristics they had. It, it's the genesis of the can slim approach. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and were he um, with us today, I'm certain that he would agree that this is one of those stocks. Yeah. And and one of the reasons why I wanted to switch to the MarketSmith chart, you know, not only just show this monthly uh, phenomenal performance, but this, this also kind of fits into what we call the long-term leader status. Uh, the reason being is that it has this EPS growth rate uh, that's pretty pretty significant, 15%, nothing to sneeze at, doing that annually, you know, for three to five years or more. But more importantly, the earning stability, you know, yeah. this is a, a low earning stability um, number, it goes from one to 99, the lower means less volatile uh, on its earnings number. And so usually when you get kind of a, a nice growth rate with great stability, and a relative strength line that is able to outperform long term like this on the monthly. Uh, that's that's kind of our our long term leader. Uh, you know, that, that, yeah. that's a, that's ex that's exactly what we look for. So uh, good to see that you're <laughs> you're kind of in line there too. So um, real quickly, I'm going to go ahead and switch back over to uh, the, the the Bollinger Bands. Um, for this one, do you think it would be better for us to take a look at the um, at the weekly chart in terms yeah. of that? Okay, so let me go ahead. Um, I'm gonna switch over to that uh, and I'll switch to the weekly chart uh, with the Bollinger Bands in place. And when, when you're switching to different time frames, do you make any adjustments to your, uh, to your, to your stats? Do you still use no. a 20 period and two standard deviations? Mm -hmm. So in this case, it's gonna be a 20 week average and, mm -hmm. and, and two standard deviations of 20 weeks worth of data. Yeah. Okay. And so um, it, it seems like it's been a while since it's kind of touched uh, touched one of the lower bands. It's really yeah. kind of been sticking between those yeah. bands uh, very nicely. If anything, it's it's kind of gotten up above the bands uh, lately. Um, so uh, so, so do that, you just wait then? That's what a real strong stock will do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just um, it's. Uh, um, you know, it's it's a walk up the upper band, um, and you know, on these pullbacks to to the lower band, that's you know, that's where we look to add to these to these positions. We wait for the decline to stop, and mm -hmm. we wait for you know some evidence that the the trend is going to resume, um, and then um, so that's a a technical overlay um, within a you know fundamental idea. Right. Mm -hmm. So and let's talk. Oh, you know, go ahead. That, for me, that's the cat's jammies, right? I mean, that, that's <laughs> you know, that's that's when you, you you ever see these the these pictures and you know like in Boston the the eight the eight people in in, in the skull pulling the yeah all pulling the oars in a coordinated manner. That's what you have going. You that's what you have going on here. You have all these different pieces and they're all coordinated and they're pulling you along. You you got a strong stock and a strong group and a, in a strong sector, um, you know, and, and with, with great fundamentals and great technicals, you just keep on piling the information on. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Uh, let's go ahead and switch over a little bit more into the tech space. Uh, Intel, uh, of course, you know, Intel, ticker symbol INTC, um, it's you know, it's 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 kind of gotten its lunch eaten by NVIDIA and AMD. And, you know, I mean, this used to be the big behemoth. Um, do you think Intel can come back? And why is this on your radar now? So I this is an example of another sort of thing that we do here. You know, we went through that very long period of low interest rates um, mm -hmm. and we look for stocks that that had 
dividends to replace bonds in our, mm. in our portfolios. And, and Intel came into our management world in that guise, right? It had a big fat dividend. We, 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 we examined it pretty carefully. We thought that uh, um, it was sustainable. Um, and um, so we bought it as an income generator in the mm. portfolio. But um, like IBM, which we bought in the same mold, um, both of them have turned from income generators into capital gains vehicles. And as, as of now, we see both of those you know, with substantial upside um, in front of them. We think Intel can actually uh, go to new highs here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and getting getting back to its old uh, old highs, I mean, that would be something. And uh, paradoxically, of course, uh, the, the, the more it goes up, uh, the less that yield gets to be, right? Because uh, you're, yeah. you're changing the denominator. And uh, so, yeah, the, the yield on Intel now is just a 1.1%. So not much to write home about. But as you mentioned, uh, you've got a, a great deal of capital appreciation as it's gone from, uh, what was this, like 20, you know, below 25 to 40, 45 now. So a, a good 20 points, almost a, almost a double uh, in, in not too long a period uh, under a year. So if you if you take a look at a very long term chart of, of, of it, you can see that there's some trouble coming up um, for it. It's got some right. pretty important hurdles um, to um, overcome here in terms of past resistance, where a lot of shareholders are going to be saying, oh, my God, I'm whole again. Let me get out, out, <laughs> out. <laughs> uh -huh. So there's going to be a lot of supply uh, um, for it to work its way through. Uh, and, and we think it's going to have, you know, we think it's going to have, you know, a relatively tough time doing so, but we see no sign of it weakening yet. So um, um, we got our eye on it. It's interesting. <laughs> I have a, a market Smith chart up on a, another screen here and I put it on the monthly chart and it's running right into its 50 month moving average. I just have one moving average on the chart hitting it in a very similar manner that it's hitting the upper band uh, on the monthly chart that Justin's shown right there. Well, Arusha, you know that's uh, um, that's what moving averages often do is they show you um, if they're w if they're well suited to that vehicle, they show you where the past areas of supply and demand um, were and where you stand in relation to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, with with the fact that it's kind of running potentially into uh, this former area of resistance, um, what what do you what do you do? Uh, are you looking for signals that Okay, this resistance gonna is going to be too much, and we have to back away. Or do you just kind of uh, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead? No, not damn the torpedoes. Uh, and the torpedoes are real, and you have to pay attention to them. Yeah. Um, uh, we'd look for signs of technical de de deterioration, which we haven't seen yet. Um, that mm -hmm. that's that's our primary thing. We would also look. Uh, I mean, you talked earlier about macro. We, we we'd look at macro factors that we think might impact it. Frankly, it's building fabs and 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 building them quickly and 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 doing a good job of them. So the macro picture is actually actually relatively appealing. Um, I don't want to get into the whole U.S. versus China and chip wars mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. and 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 all this thing, but. Um, I think people are going to appreciate um, Intel for some of the things that it can do, um, and that could be potentially be a positive factor for the stock in the long haul. Mm -hmm. And with everyone talking about Nvidia, you know, um, how does how does Intel kind of fit in with, you know, again the just how Nvidia kind of sucks all the air out of the room when people are talking well, about chips. Okay, so put up a chart of Nvidia. Okay. Uh, and uh, would you like a, a a weekly chart here as as well? Um, That's fine. Weekly's or, fine. Okay, weekly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Nvidia's running out of steam. If you look at this chart, you know Nvidia's gains period of big gains are way behind it. It's been going sideways here um, mm -hmm. for um, for for quite a while um, at a much reduced um, rate of appreciation. Um, I think Nvidia is one of those stocks that's probably going a little too far, a little too fast, and is going to sit around and consolidate for a while. Um, I don't, I, I'm not negative on on, on Nvidia, but um, I, I don't think that one really it, it's Intel or Nvidia. I think they're different stories and different 
different uh, um, situations. And, you know, in the right portfolio, I imagine you could own both of them. Yeah. Very good. Well, let's go ahead and turn our attention over to Amazon.com to round out our discussion on stocks. Here's the weekly um, on Amazon.com with the Bollinger Bands. Um, so what what are we looking at here? So um, um, can we have so, some more bars there? Is, it, is that? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. So Amazon uh, um, topped out um, a long time ago and been going uh, you know, had, had a big downtrend and sideways period now trying to advance again, trying to recover some of that it's running to pretty serious overhead resistance here in the 150 area. I think it's going to have an awful lot of trouble clearing that. Mm -hmm. um, that's not a negative. Uh, um, I'm not saying it's not going to be able to clear it. It's just going to have a, a tough time um, doing so. So, you know, the, the first two stocks that we, we, we talked about, were what I call investment vehicles, right? They, one was long-term growth candidate. Another is a, 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 a turnaround situation for, from a stock that was wildly out of favor to a stock that's coming back into favor. Um, and here we have what I think of as a trading vehicle, essentially. You asked about you know, my holding periods and stuff like that. For, for stock like Amazon, you know, we buy... We, we look to buy setups and, 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 and sell rallies. We look to sell tops and, and, and buy, buy back in. We don't, you know, this stock's been going sideways for, for years now. Um, and, and it covers a lot of ground while doing so. It's a, mm -hmm. it's, it's a solid company underneath it, um, especially with the, with the web services and the, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, the cloud computing uh, yeah. capabilities. So it's not going to go to zero, right? It's not going to go crashing down on you. So it's a great trading vehicle. You can get into it, get out of it, move around, uh, especially for, for you know, th those people who like to trade options. There's tons of tons of opportunities um, to, to do some option strategies around a stock like this. So, the, you know, the, the, my last example here was specifically um, meant you know, to be for traders, uh, opportunities to go long, opportunities to go short, um, in, in, in stock with really healthy underlying fundamentals so that you, you, you don't have to worry about it doing, um, you know, what some stocks have done in the past, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, just, just to kind of, um, you know, put, put, put a nice bow on this, uh, you're, you're looking at, a lot of different, I guess, strategies. You know, you're 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 looking at those long-term ones. You're looking at those trading vehicles. I could imagine with Amazon here, you're you're able to, you know, maybe trade around a core position. Um, you know, for some of these, where you're trimming a little bit on on the way up, adding a little bit on the way down. Um, do you, do you have a favorite? Uh, I mean, you, you you kind of talked a lot about a lot of different ways to get into these stocks. Uh, do you have kind of your bread and butter? What what your what your favorite is? So, um, do, well, two things. We, I, I, I run a classic uh, um, investment company here. Uh, we, we provide, um, you know, in, in we provide investment advice to individuals, small plans, and, and and such like that. And for those people, you know, these long-term growers like Centus, you know, that's the bread and butter of that business. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's you know. That's the sort of thing that people want to participate in, and we're, we're looking at long-term wealth building. Um, um, for you know, more trading-oriented um, things, we have things like Amazon. We look at Ws and Ms and squeezes and bulges, and such like that. We take a different approach for 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 a long-term growth stock like like Centus. We 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 you know use the bands to tell us where we might look to add to positions or, or get clients in that don't have exposure to that particular stock into that stock. So mm -hmm. it just depends on, on what we do. Nice thing about having an independent RIA and being active managers is that we have the ability to adapt what we're doing to market conditions. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like what you said, you know, ETFs, mutual funds, they, they all have their mandate and they kind of have to stick to that, but uh, you got a lot of flexibility. Uh, to, to kind of go where the market takes you uh, and, and have that flexibility to do so. Well, 
John, I uh, really, really appreciate you coming on the show. Appreciate you sharing all your knowledge, of course, on Bollinger Bands. Uh, might as well go to the creator to, to get the full <laughs> scoop. Uh, it was really great having you on. I, I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Justin and Arusha. Um, really, really fun to sit and chat with you guys. Um, and I look forward to doing so again. Yeah, awesome. We'll definitely do that. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for this show. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And of course, make sure you join us next week because we're going to have one of the crowd favorites back on, Anne-Marie Band from The Trading Book. Uh, she, I'm sure, uses Bollinger Bands herself. Uh, so we'll kind of get her take on some of the things that she's doing with options, futures, uh, and some of the indicators that she uses. Uh, it's always a great show with her, a great educator. So hope you tune in for that. And thanks a lot for watching us this week. We'll see you next time.